Hello, good afternoon, people of the seed. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our next speaker is our very special keynote speaker, Jean Bauer, co-founder and president of Farm Sanctuary. Also wanted to let you guys know at our raffle table, all of the raffle ticket proceeds that we are selling go to benefit Jean's Farm Sanctuary. We're also selling tickets to our VIP event right after the seed at 6.30 at Sweetwater Social. Uh, there will be an hour open bar and you'll also get the goodie bag. So every single donation there and any, every single uh, ticket sale is going to benefit Farm Sanctuary. So, and after Jean's talk, we're also going to do a book signing at the back over there. So you guys are welcome to come ask more questions, get a book signed and give them a high five. So thank you very much. And please help me welcome Jean Bauer. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate being here. It was amazing coming in. There was a line out the door. And, you know, I've been a vegan since 1985. And it's never been a better time to be vegan than now. Uh, there's more awareness, more interest, more recognition that our current food system is messed up. And uh, so we're at a really, I think, pivotal time. Um, and we have enormous opportunities to catapult this movement. And events like this, I think, are part of that. It's wonderful to see so many people here, so many great vendors, so many businesses that are producing vegan foods, vegan cheese, which, you know, for vegans has been a challenge for many years, but it's getting a lot easier. When Farm Sanctuary started back in 1986, um, I spent a lot of time going into farms to document conditions. And um, I don't want to get into too much detail about the goriness of it because it is painful. And, but, you know, animals are treated like commodities on our industrial farming system where they're put in cages where they can't move. The 600-pound pigs are put in two-foot-wide metal cages for their whole lives. Chickens live in these battery cages where they're packed so tightly they can't even stretch their wings. They're constantly scraping against the bars of their cages. Their feathers wear off. And you go into these places and you see thousands and thousands of animals suffering and screaming. In, in the case of pigs, they are screaming to get out of their crates. You hear them clanking against the bars. The air is thick with ammonia and, and toxic fumes. And that's how these animals live their whole lives. So these conditions are obviously bad for the animals. They're bad physically because they can't exercise, they can't move. They're bad emotionally because the animals can't be who they are. They can't express themselves at all. And it's also bad for the workers. You know, could you imagine what it would be like to go to work at a place like this where, you know, you're breathing in these noxious fumes? In fact, a lot of times the workers have these, these masks on their face to prevent the inha inhalation of lots of toxins. Um, and, and then could you imagine what it would be wor like to work at a slaughterhouse? where you know, the job is to cut the throats of animals eight hours a day. Now, these are violent, bloody realities that billions of animals have to experience every year. And people you know, who work in this industry, I actually also feel sorry for. This is a violent, bloody, abusive business. The good news is we don't have to support it. You know, there's lots of things in this world that are very far outside of our control. You know, it's hard for us to you know, have a big impact on what's happening in Iraq or, you know, in other parts of the world. We can write to our political leaders or, or political representatives, I should say, and encourage them to do certain things. But it's pretty tangential. We don't really have a lot of control over what's gonna happen internationally or even nationally or even at the state level or even at the city level. But we all have a lot of control over what we decide to put in our mouths, what we decide to eat. And those choices are made every day. And those choices have profound consequences. Buying a McDonald's hamburger, you know, seems like a pretty innocuous act, but the impacts are immense. The animals suffer to produce this meat. Um, the environment suffers. There was an article in the New York Times a few years ago called Rethinking the Meat Guzzler, 
And in the article, the author compared the amount of fossil fuels needed for a vegetarian meal versus a meat meal. He found it took 16 times more fossil fuels for the meat meal. So that's a consequence of buying meat. Water is another huge issue. You know, it takes a lot of water to, to grow crops that are then fed to animals. And then those animals are raised and slaughtered in slaughterhouses that will use over a million gallons of water a day themselves. So we squander all this water. And out in California now, and out in many parts of the West, water is becoming a very scarce, very precious resource. And it's being squandered by this industry. And then we have our health care issues. Um, there's a movie out called Forks Over Knives. How many of you have seen the movie Forks Over Knives? Okay, so, so this, this is a very impactful film. Talks about how we could reverse many of our diseases in this country by shifting to a whole foods, plant-based diet. The experts in that film, and these are Caldwell Esselstyn, who's a medical doctor at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, and Colin Campbell, who's a nutritional biochemist at Cornell University, They've been working on these issues for decades, and they have come to believe that we, in this country, could save something like 70% on our health care costs by shifting to a whole foods plant-based diet. 70%. That's massive. So these are the profound impacts of our food choices. But most of us grow up without really thinking about them. I grew up, like most of us here probably, eating animals. And I didn't really think about it. You know, my parents were eating animals. My brothers and sisters were eating animals. Everybody around me was eating animals. And it's just something that I adopted as a habit. But I didn't make a conscious choice to do it. As time went and I started recognizing what was happening to these animals, and it started with my grandmother when I was in high school. She told me how veal calves were raised. And I did not like the idea of a young calf taken from his mother immediately after birth, chained by the neck in a crate where he could not turn around for his whole life to be raised for veal. So I said, I'm not going to eat veal anymore. But this was in high school, and I just didn't like that cruelty. And at the time, I didn't recognize that this is how most farm animals are treated. They're treated like commodities. They're treated very badly. So I was eating meat still, although I didn't eat veal. Um, but as time went, and I started learning about the many impacts of animal agriculture on the environment and how we could feed so many more people if we grew plant foods and ate them directly. Instead of growing corn and soy and other crops and feeding them to animals, um, I realized how inefficient the system was. And then I started meeting vegetarians and vegans and learning that I could actually live and do well by eating only plants and no animal foods. And you know, I started asking myself, and I think it's an, it's an important question for everybody really to consider, is if we can live well without causing unnecessary violence, why wouldn't we? And you know, I think most people don't like to cause other animals harm. Most people don't like violence. Most people don't like to see the planet destroyed. <laughs> Um, you know, another thing in terms of the environment is animal agriculture contributes more to climate change than the entire transportation industry. So this is a whole other impact, and that's according to a United Nations study. So, you know, this is an industry that causes harm to animals, to ourselves, and to the planet, and it's one that most people grow up unwittingly supporting without really thinking about it. So as we look at these issues and recognize the impacts and also recognize that we have a choice, it can be a very empowering thing. And, you know, going vegan one, was one of the best things I ever did in, in 1985. And, you know, since that time, uh, we have incredible athletes, people like Scott Jurek, who is here, who's winning these 152 mile races as a vegan. You know, so these ideas that you can't get everything you need nutritionally uh, with plant foods are, are, are myths and those are now being dismantled. I was in Canada uh, last year, and there was this guy named Patrick Babouillon who is one of the strongest men in Germany, and he broke a world record. He carried like over 1,200 pounds on a yoke. He walked over 10 meters with that. That was a world record, and he's a vegan. So you have vegans that are showing strength, showing endurance, and then you have people like Carl Lewis, who is an Olympic gold medalist who did his best times 
on a vegan diet. So this idea that you can't get what you need on plant foods is, is, is not accurate. And it is one of the myths and, that we grow up with and is one of the reasons that a lot of people are afraid of shifting to become, to adopting a vegan lifestyle. Um, but again, for, for those of us here who have adopted a vegan lifestyle, I think many of us have the same sort of experience where you have more energy, your health is good. Um, as long as you're eating good food, one quick caution on the vegan diet is, you know, Oreos and Coke are vegan. And if we just eat that, we're probably not going to do so good over time. And in the early days, I wasn't nearly as health oriented as I have become as you get older, which often happens. Um, I went vegan when I was like 23 and, and co-founded Farm Sanctuary right around then and spent a lot of time, you know, going into factory farms and working on the farm, doing a lot of physical stuff. Never had really any problems. And I've still never had any significant problems. But lately, I've been running marathons. I've done some triathlons. I did an Ironman triathlon last year where you um, swim 2.4 miles, bike 112 miles, and then you run a marathon. So when you're doing that kind of athletic thing and training for that, you need to get pretty intense nutrition. So that has caused me to pay more attention to what I eat and to get adequate calories, to get adequate greens, to get Nutri you know, nutrit nutritiously dense foods. And I've done that all on a vegan diet. You know, it's nothing like some of these elite athletes, but it shows again that on plant foods you can do an awful lot, a lo an awful lot more than most people do. Um, so, so these are a lot of myths and beliefs that we grow up with, you know, again about food, which are now being smashed, and we can obviously do very well eating plant foods and no animal foods. Another of the sorts of belief systems that comes into place is that farm animals are there for this purpose, you know, right? Uh, you know, if, why are they here? Well, you know, we mass produce them. And in some cases, they've been so profoundly altered genetically that they couldn't even reproduce naturally anymore. You know, turkeys, for example, have been genetically bred to have very large breasts because breast meat is the most profitable. And because of that, they're not able to mount and reproduce anymore. So all commercially raised turkeys are now products of artificial insemination. Uh, people sometimes ask me, well, what happens if everybody in the world goes vegan? What's going to happen to all these farm animals? Well, in some cases, certain strains would, would no longer exist, like these turkeys, for example, who can't breed naturally and whose lives can be pretty difficult because they're so heavy. We've genetically bred them to grow big and to grow fast. And because their breasts are so heavy, they also have a difficulty walking because their legs are very weak and, and have a hard time carrying that huge weight. So um, certain species, it probably would be better if they weren't here, honestly. Chickens are the same way. They've been genetically bred to grow twice as big and twice as fast as normal. They grow so fast and so large that their hearts and lungs have a hard time supporting their growth rate. And in many cases, they die at just a couple weeks old. And these are young birds that are so heavy that their hearts can't support that. And you know, it's sort of a perverse parallel between their lives and the lives of us in this country, you know, where obesity is becoming a real issue. You know, so what we do to others has impacts on us. There are physical impacts, you know, heart disease and cancer are the top killers in this country. The risks of both can be seriously lessened by shifting to a whole foods, plant-based diet and away from animal foods, away from processed foods. But there are also emotional impacts. When you abuse somebody, whether it's a human or another animal, or when you, you know, when there are wars with somebody else, with them, there's a tendency to start denigrating your enemy and to start calling them names and to stop really understanding or wanting to understand and see them for who they are. There's that really touching story about, I think it was during World War I, when on Christmas Eve you had, I think, the German troops on one side and the English troops on the other side. And as midnight was coming close on, on Christmas Eve, 
the German uh, troops were started singing Silent Night. And then the English troops heard it and recognized the tune, and they started singing Silent Night. And then they came together and had a celebration and a Christmas together. And then the generals and the officers said, no more cavorting with the enemy. You have to go out there and kill them. So when there is violence and when there is harm being caused against someone else, there's this need to separate ourselves. And, 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 and in some cases, that means denigrating the victim. And in the case of farm animals, um, you know, we have, you know, being called a pig is not a compliment. And, and there are certain myths that also develop around that. For example, there's this old story that turkeys are really dumb. And to illustrate this point, they say turkeys are so dumb, they go outside in the rain and drown. You know, we've been taking care of turkeys since 1986. And they can come inside, they can go outside. They've never gone outside and drowned in the rain. You know, so these are stories that are told, these are myths that are told to support a particular behavior. And I would suggest that this is not only bad for the other animals, it is bad for us. Cruelty uh, and abuse like this that causes us to lose our own empathy, I think makes us less than we could be. Um, one of our first visitors to the farm up in Watkins Glen, New York, was a pig farmer. And what's really struck me over the years is that farmers don't really understand farm animals. You know, they raise animals in cages where the animals can't move. So how do you really get to know them? Um, and, you know, but they think they know them. They say, I've raised thousands of animals. I'm an expert. So anyway, this one pig farmer visits our farm in Watkins Glen. He goes into the pig barn, and he sees some of our volunteers taking care of these 500-pound sows. So these are really big animals. And this pig farmer is genuinely worried about our volunteers, thinking that these pigs are dangerous. And he tells me that, you know, we better get those volunteers out of the barn, otherwise the pigs are going to attack them. And I told him that, you know, we had not had a problem with pigs attacking us, um, that, you know, often they come in and they're afraid because they've only been treated badly by people. Um, but over time, they learn to trust us, they understand they're in a safe place, and they don't attack us. They, in fact, enjoy our company. And this pig farmer said, no, look, I've raised pigs for years. I understand these animals. I know them. And you can't trust them. They're violent and aggressive. So he, he told me this. And to illustrate his point, he told a story about a sow he had, a mother pig, who had babies. And he took the babies away. And the mother came after him. And he used this to say, to make the case that this pig is a violent, aggressive animal without having any thought about the fact that this mother pig had an opinion and a very strong feeling about the, the idea of her babies being taken away. So there's this blindness that sometimes occurs when people mistreat others. Um, and there's, I think it was, um, there's a really great quote, I can't remember exactly who said it right now, but it, it is, we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. And in the case of this pig farmer, he had this, you know, lack of empathy, this lack of understanding, this assumption that he was entitled to the piglets. And he didn't think at all about the mother who was upset by it. And instead of understanding that, he denigrates and says these animals are violent. And the response to that is you put them in crates so they can't move. And that's kind of how we got to the factory farming world that we currently live in. And how this abuse just has been perpetuated year after year. And it's been getting worse as large farms have been pushing out small farms. Industrialized animal agriculture has become the norm. And the animals are seen as commodities, as tools of production, not as living, feeling creatures. And, uh, and that is a situation that allows horrible abuse to become normalized. So bad has become normal on today's farms. 
and bad has also become normal in terms of our own health in this country. You know, when you get to be a certain age, it's just expected you're going to go on heart medication. You know, I've been a vegan for, like I mentioned, since 1985, hadn't been to a doctor in like 20 years, and I figured, you know, I might as well go see a doctor just to make sure, you know, something's not, some, everything's okay. So I go to this doctor, and he starts asking me questions like, is, is there any heart disease in the family? So I told him, yes, my, my grandfather died of a heart attack, my father had a heart attack, and then without doing any testing uh, or taking my blood samples or anything, he said, well, I might want to put you on heart medication. It was astounding to me. So I left that hospital, went to another doctor, and basically said, take my blood and tell me what it says. So he took my blood, and when it came back, everything was in the normal range. There was only one reading that was outside the normal range, and that was my bad cholesterol, and it was below the low normal. So that was probably not a terrible thing. So bad has become normal in our country where heart medication and other drugs become part of the norm. And if everybody's doing it, we assume that it's the way it's supposed to be. So this you know, gets back to the point I was making earlier about how I grew up eating meat because everybody around me was doing it. And I imagine for most of us here, that was the same. And we are social animals. We affect those around us. We rub off on those around us. And that's why it gives me such, such, such a, a good feeling to be at a place like this, because each person here who adopts a healthier plant-based lifestyle becomes an ambassador for a new lifestyle. And, and just by interacting with people who are not aware of these issues and are not vegan, you send ripples, you affect others. If you go out to dinner with somebody and if you order the vegan meal when other people are eat, ordering meat, people notice that. And just being an example has an effect. It sends out ripples. And um, I've worked in these issues for many, many years and I've worked on legislation from time to time. And I've come to believe that where the real change is ultimately going to happen is going to be in the marketplace with citizens making conscious choices and educating others about, uh, about these issues. And that doesn't only mean talking about the abuses that happen on factory farms and the, and the environmental harm and so on. It also involves food in a big way. Um, that's where the rubber hits the road. The reason that so many animals suffer in our agricultural system is because people are eating them. And I think one of the reasons people are slow to change is they're afraid of change. If you grow up a certain way, bombarded with myths like you need meat for protein or cow's milk for calcium, you're bombarded with this, and everybody's doing it, everybody's eating that way, changing can be scary. That's why each of us can play a role in supporting small changes. And this could be as simple as going out to dinner with somebody or, or having somebody over to your house for dinner and showing them that vegan food is actually tasty and satisfying. I think that that type of action helps to undo the fear because people who are contemplating the idea of being vegan sometimes say, oh, I could never do that. Or what do you eat? Or where do you get your protein, right? So if you provide food, it answers the what do you eat question right away. And, and it also helps to undermine this fear of, oh, or, or, and this, frankly, disempowering statement that, oh, I could never do that. Because if they try this food and they like it, they probably will think, well, you know what, I could do that. And it becomes empowering. Um, and so I think leading by example, supporting small steps. And, you know, the number of animals being killed in the U.S. has actually started going down. So that's a very positive thing. That's the first time that's ever happened. And I think part of that has to do, <laughs> all right. I, I think part of that has to do with um, the fact that people are eating less meat. So it's not that we're seeing more and more vegans, although I think we are seeing more vegans. Um, but people are just becoming more concerned about their food, and that's a good thing. And, and they're thinking about it. I mean, that's what it starts with. It starts with thinking about it.
instead of mindlessly adopting habits and continuing to engage in those habits like eating meat mindlessly. So thinking about it is where it begins. And if there's a vegan eating with 30 non-vegans, they start thinking. I was um, speaking at this conference at, at, at Ohio State University a number of years ago. And I find it pretty interesting and positive that they have me, a vegan, come speak to these animal science people. And so I was at this conference and I always request a vegan meal. And it's kind of fun to request a vegan meal at a agribusiness conference. <laughs> and so before lunch, it was, it was a buffet. And so the host of the conference said that there's some vegan food out there in the buffet. And a lot of people sort of chuckled. And she said, and it looks really good. So unless you've ordered a vegan meal, uh, you know, stay away from it. <laughs> Which was, you know, kind of a nice thing for these agribusiness people to say, to hear. And then during lunch, I'm sitting there eating my vegan meal and a couple of the farmers around me say, that looks pretty good. Um, and then they asked me, well, what kind of pig farming do you think is humane? And I said, the kind where they don't kill the pigs. <laughs> and... You know, even people in the farming business, I think, are often conflicted. There's this farmer I've been talking to who's in upstate New York. His name is Bob Comas. Has anybody heard about him? He, he's written some stuff in the Huffington Post. And he raises pigs as humanely as they can be raised. They're outdoors. I've been to his farm a couple of times. Um, but even so, he was conflicted about the idea of killing animals. It's an inherently violent act. And he wrote some things for the Huffington Post saying that I do the best I can, but I still don't feel good about it. At the end of the day, I am a slaver and a murderer. And he used those words. So he was really struggling with the way these animals were still being seen just as pieces of meat. A few months ago, he decided to go vegetarian and he's now in the process of transitioning his pig farm into becoming a veganic farm. So you have change like that starting to happen. And he talks about how killing the animals is bad for the animals, but it is also bad for the farmer. And I really do believe that. I've been into a lot of these places. I've seen the violence that is the norm. Again, bad becoming normal and where people start behaving in ways that are disturbing and, and it's unnecessary. So I've got a few slides here I'm gonna just run through. They're kind of fun slides. So a lot of us grow up with our dogs and our cats and they're part of the family. We know them, we love them. They have different personalities. Um, and you know this, when I've been to these industry conferences, uh, they talk about this as a concern because, you know, as we start relating to dogs as part of our family, you know, you start raising, thinking about what about other animals who are treated so differently, despite the fact that they also have feelings and they have babies who they love and, fe and they want to enjoy life just like our dogs and our cats and us. So the industry is really um, recognizing that it needs to deal with a growing, evolving relationship we have with other animals. And at the end of the day, this boils down to what is our relationship with other animals? Is it one of mutual benefit? Is it one of companionship? Or, as in the case of factory farming, is it one of cruelty and exploitation and callousness? And then rationalization and humans who disconnect from our empathy. And obviously, you know, which one I think makes more sense, and I think most people do. Most people are humane, most people don't, don't like animals to suffer, um, and that's why oftentimes when the issue of factory farming comes up, people say, don't tell me I don't wanna know, because it is upsetting. And so for us, it's challenging to, to educate people and show people what's happening, but to not turn them off and have them say, I don't wanna see it. And this is where, again, food can be so great because you show somebody a, give somebody a great vegan cookie and they love it and it has an impact. You don't necessarily have to say it's a vegan cookie at first either.
because they'll think you're trying to proselytize, and people don't like that. But just being generous and showing how good vegan food is can have an enormous impact, and it's very positive. And in as much as we human beings like to talk about how we're rational animals, we really are more emotional, I think, and we do things because of how it makes us feel. And when it comes to doing something we don't really feel very good about, we become rationalizing animals. You know, I have to eat meat for my protein, is, is a prime example of this rationalization, which is completely bogus. So, at the end of the day, I think we want people to m live in a way that is aligned with our own values, live in a way that we can feel good about instead of saying, I don't want to see it because it's upsetting. And as a vegan, I feel great to know that my food is coming from places that are not exploiting other animals. I mean, it's, it's physically positive, it's emotionally positive as well. So when you make choices aligned with your own values and you don't live in a dissonant sort of way, it's empowering and it feels really good. We also want to encourage people to make choices that are aligned with our interests, to eat food that doesn't make us sick. I mean, that's kind of a basic statement to make, but if you look at our country, we're eating food that's making us sick. It's kind of crazy and totally irrational, but that's kind of what we do. So if we shifted away and ate food that was good for us, we would see a whole foods, plant-based diets emerging all over the place. And also, if we ate food that was aligned with our interest, we would not be buying food from these farms that exploit animals and destroy the planet. You know, the, the earth, you know, it's in all of our interest not to destroy it. But animal agriculture is among the top contributors to the most serious environmental problems we're facing on our planet today. According to the United Nations, the UN put out a report called um, Livestock's Long Shadow a few years ago, talking about how animal agriculture is one of the top contributors to the most serious problems, including climate change. It, it contributes more to climate change than the entire transportation industry. So, so it's not in our interest. And it's also not in our interest to abuse other animals and to see them as just pieces of meat when they are living, feeling creatures just like our cats and dogs. It's, you know, I was talking about factory farms and how horrible it is to go in there and see animals confined in cages, screaming and clanking against their bars. You contrast that with animals running free and enjoying life and living at a place like Farm Sanctuary. How many of you have been to Farm Sanctuary? Okay, a few of you. Come, on, come back if you've been there. And if you haven't been there, please come visit. It's a sanctuary for animals. It's also a sanctuary for people. And farm animals don't only have physical needs, they have emotional needs. That pig on the left is Eric, who lives at Farm Sanctuary and, and had his little teddy bear or teddy pig or whatever you call it. <laughs> they like to cuddle. They're very emotional, too. And they connect with their babies, you know, as I mentioned before. Um, and being good to animals, you know, they bring us joy as well, right? Isn't that a much more positive kind of interaction than you would see at a factory farm or at a slaughterhouse? I mean, this is a joyful kind of thing, and that's the kind of choice we can make. We don't need to kill animals. We don't need to exploit them. We can live very well on plant foods. And pigs love belly rubs, sort of like dogs. At, at Farm Sanctuary, when you go into the pig barn and you start rubbing one of these pigs' bellies, and these are like 800-pound animals in some cases, they will flop down, and they will grunt to communicate that they're enjoying the belly rub. So they communicate. You know, for a long time, um, human beings have tried to figure out why we are different than other animals. You know, for a long time, it was said that we're the only animal that uses tools. And I think one of the reasons that we've wanted to say we're different is because we don't treat the other animals very well and we needed to have a rationalization for it. So we're the only animal that uses tools. But then Jane Goodall saw that other animals were using tools and then we had to change it. And then we said, well, we're the only animal that uses language. But the more we look, the more we see that other animals communicate in what could be considered to be language. So now what we say is, well, we're the only animals that have a soul.
but, but how do you really prove that, right? So, I mean, the bottom line is we are connected with other animals, and we are connected with each other, and when we do harm to others, you know, we hurt everybody. And again, the great news is we don't have to do it. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's growing opposition to factory farming, which is a very good thing. But there's also been a movement lately to sell animal foods labeled as free range or humane. And, uh, and that's actually a growing market. So the good news is there's opposition to factory farming. The bad news is that this market uh, is misrepresenting the conditions. And a lot of people are buying animal foods that they think are from farms that are nice, when in fact those farms are not very nice. And this is actually a picture of a free range farm, just to give you a sense. For something to be called free range, it only requires that animals be given access to the outdoors. So here you have a warehouse, and inside of it you would have thousands of chickens. And then they have this little porch area, and that's considered to be access to the outdoors. And then those chickens and their eggs could be sold as free range. So anyway, I just want to point out that, you know, as the opposition to factory farming has grown, the opportunities to market animal foods as humane has increased. Food retailers are doing this making significant profit margins, um, and the animals are still not actually living very well. So the way I kind of see the, this big sort of uh, arc of change is, factory farming is way over here, it is the worst of the worst. The animals are seen, treated horribly. Over here, we have the veganic farm, which is the perfect world, and whether we can create it or not, we will see. All plant-based, no animal exploitation. So between the factory farming world, we start seeing a shift now towards this, this kind of free range, which is not that different than factory farming. So it's pretty much right over in this area. Then you start getting to a handful of farmers that actually are treating their animals better, where the animals are outdoors. Now that's a small number, and, but they are significantly different than the factory farm that we see in this way, but the way Farm Sanctuary defines a factory farm is one that sees animals as raw materials to be exploited for profit. So even this farm in our definition would be a factory farm, uh, and the animals are still exploited, but their lives are significantly less bad than that. They're not good, but they're less bad. And then you start moving over here into the plant-based agriculture world, where you could have industrialized you know, soy production, which is not great, but it's at least plant production instead of animal exploitation. And then you move over to the veganic farm. So our intensity of opposition against factory farming is at its highest. Our enthusiasm for veganic farming as at its highest. And then as you sort of move through these different levels, our intensity sort of adjusts. So like the farmer that's treating animals less bad, we don't like that the animals are being killed and exploited. But those guys actually will also speak out against the factory farms. So in some ways, there's an alliance there. And this pig farmer, Bob Comas, who I've been speaking to, talks about this space. And this is the space he's been operating in. And he says that when you start having this discussion about animals and the need to treat them well, you then start opening minds. And that's what happened to him. So in this area, it's largely about getting people to think. And when people start to think, and when they start to recognize that they can live without eating animals, I think that's ultimately the direction we're going. But we still have a lot of factory farms we gotta deal with. We have some of these guys that are allies sometimes and not other times. We have the veganic farming that is a very, very small burgeoning movement. But we also have farmers markets, CSAs, community gardens, a lot of really positive things happening great vegan businesses like many that are here today, uh, vegan restaurants, even restaurants that are not vegan that have vegan food. So it's good to go to those and support them too. So that is where um, change is really starting to happen and, and, it's, and it's a very positive thing to see. And we also have experts like the um, American Dietetic Association talking about how vegan diets are healthful, nutritionally adequate, may even provide health benefits. 
Um, Well-planned vegetarian diets are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, adolescence, and for athletes. So, you know, these nutritional experts are recognizing that plant-based eating makes sense. Um, the president-elect of the American Cardiac Association, I think it's called, is a vegan. And so you have vegans in these kinds of positions now. It is pretty amazing. You also have vegans in significant business positions. There was an article some year, some months, or a couple years ago, in uh, Men's Health, I think it was, called The Rise of the Power Vegans, talking about vegan executives. You know, people like John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, who's a vegan. Um, Biz Stone, co-founder of Twitter, who's a vegan. Um, and there's many, many others. So uh, Steve Wynn, the hotel guy in Vegas, is a vegan. Uh, James Cameron, uh, the movie director, is a vegan. So there's more and more, you know, Bill Clinton and, and um, Al Gore. Oh, well, Bill Clinton's not a completely vegan. He's a cheating vegan, I guess you'd say. <laughs> but, but he's mostly there. And, uh, and Al Gore recently is a vegan. So, you know, this is significant when you have people like that, because they're also going out to eat with people who also have some influence, and they're eating vegan. That has an impact. So there's some amazing things happening now. And also, again, the... Uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics talks about how plant-based eating is healthy. And, and, and eating healthy expands our lifespan. I just have one last slide here to show about the lifespan of farm animals because most people don't really think about these individuals and the lives they have. They don't live very long. You know, veal calves are killed at like 24 weeks. You know, they normally live 15 to 20 years. Chickens are killed at five to seven weeks. They could live up to eight years. Turkeys are killed at four to five months old, and they live up to 15 years. So, you know, you have animals that are treated very badly that would maybe not survive very long because the conditions are so bad, but because they're killed so young, the industry can still get away with this. Um, pigs are killed at six months old. They would normally live over 10 years. Uh, sheep are killed at six months old. They'd live 12 to 14. Beef cattle killed at six to eight months. Uh, chickens used for egg production will be killed at about 18 months, and dairy cows live the longest, and they're killed at about four years old. Um, and for a dairy cow, um, they are pushed very, very hard. You know, to give milk, they have to have a calf every year. You know, cows don't lactate just for the heck of it. So they, they have a calf, the baby is taken away immediately at birth, the mother is hooked up to milk machines, and she's pushed to produce about 10 times more milk than normal. So her body is under intense stress. And that's why they're killed so young, because they wouldn't last very long. So that is the sad reality of what happens to animals at factory farms. Uh, but the good news is they can live long lives at farm sanctuary. And all of us, by adopting a whole foods plant-based diet, can also live long lives, can live healthy lives, and can be examples for others, and can also help others both human and non-human, live healthier lives. And so I guess I'll just close by saying a huge thank you to The Seed for having me, for organizing this in event, for all of you for coming here. Um, we have a walk for farm animals coming up here in New York City on October 18th. It's going to be in Central Park, and it's to support the work of Farm Sanctuary. We also, every year in November, have a celebration for the turkeys at our sanctuaries. Instead of eating them, we feed them. The turkeys are the guest of honor. So this is a fun, fun event. And, and you're all welcome to visit and, and, and visit the farm, come to the that, that event or others. So check out our website, farmsanctuary.org. But again, I just want to thank you all so much for being here, for caring about these issues, and for helping to make a difference. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Gene, for that inspiring talk. Thank you, everybody, for coming to listen. And he's going to be in the back at our book signing table there. You can ask him some questions, shake his hand, give him a hug, ask him about his favorite animals. And 
Also, at our VIP, ta at our raffle table over there, we are selling tickets to our VIP party after. All proceeds will go to Farm Sanctuary as well as raffle tickets, whose proceeds will go to Farm Sanctuary as well. So please check that out at our raffle booth before you leave. It's right across from the book signing table where Jean will be. Thank you so much, guys. And about 5 o'clock, we're going to have uh, Joel Kahn.